Amen. So, of course, today is Mother's Day, and it's customary, typically on Mother's Day, to preach a Mother's Day sermon, and that's exactly what I'm going to do, okay? So, <laughs> just trying to bluff a little bit, but I don't want, you know, I thought about what, you know, if you don't preach a Mother's Day service, or, you know, bad things are going to happen. You know, the muffins are going to get burned, you know, you're going to get that stink eye and everything goes on. But here's, here's the reason. There's a reason, uh, you know, why you might get a bad reaction if you decided to kind of gloss over the Mother's Day sermon. Because that sermon is an important sermon. And that's a sermon that's got to be preached. You know? And it, quite frankly, it's one that you know, really one day doesn't warrant it. And I'm not trying to just earn brownie points here either. Okay? <laughs> it, that really is the truth. When, you, know, you don't understand it as much uh, when, when you're a child. You know, but after you become a parent, you know, even as a husband, and you, and you watch your wife become a mother and go through those things, uh, you start to understand you know, the, the real importance and the real work that goes into being a mother. And of course, uh, you know, lots of people will be preaching lots of Mother's Day sermons today. And some Mother's Day sermons, you know, they're going to be directed more towards the mothers themselves. They're going to try to encourage the mothers and things like that. And I've preached those types of Mother's Day sermons in the past. And then there's going to be other sermons that are preached to those that have mothers, right? Which is if everybody in the room, right? And today is going to lean more towards that. This Mother's Day sermon is going to be more directed towards those of us that might not be mothers, but obviously have mothers. And really all the reasons that I'm going to go into, uh, well, first let me give you the title. Okay? The title of the sermon is, Why Celebrate Mother's Day? Why Celebrate Mother's Day? Okay? And I'm going to give you some generic reasons, probably the reasons that we could all think of, but these are reasons that need to be emphasized. These are things that we need to be reminded about when it comes to mothers. They need to be em emphasized. And I was kind of thinking about this over you know the, the couple week or this week or two leading up to this service um you know our we have mother's day and then we have a daughter you know karen she's celebrating her birthday on on, on uh, tuesday and and the other people had birthdays and it kind of got me thinking about the fact that you know we kind of have it backwards when it comes to the thing of mother's day you know maybe we should have children's day you know which would be today where we just celebrate all the children being born right and rather than all the mothers having given birth and then on the children's birthday, that should be a celebration of mom. I mean, really, when you think about it, she's the one that did all the work that day. <laughs> you know, all the kid did was show up. You know, and it's usually another decade or, or even longer before that child even starts to really pull their own weight. You know, we're, we're celebrating them. Of course, we're glad they're there and stuff like that. But I thought about it. It's like, you know, we kind of have it backwards. We should have a children's day where all the kids were like, all right, we're glad you're here. You know, and then every birthday, we celebrate the mother instead, because after all, she's the one that did all the work. Of course, you know, I'm not advocating that we actually do that, but, you know, there, there's a thought there. <coughs> so let me just give you some reasons why this morning, why we should celebrate Mother's Day. It's an important holiday. It's not something that we want to just gloss over. And we should be careful that we never take our mothers for granted. Or we never take the mothers of our children for granted and the work that they do. And quite frankly, that, you know, that's, that's an easy thing to do. You know, once, once you kind of get into the routine of, you know, being a parent and you've got a few kids, you know, you can, it, it, it kind of just becomes part of life. You know, just like anything else that we do on a regular basis. And, you know, that's why we need these sermons every once in a while to just kind of remind us the importance of mothers and why it is that we should celebrate them at least one day out of the year. And one of the first reasons we want to talk about, of course, and again, these are all going to be generic, nothing profound here, but these, these are the reasons why you celebrate Mother's Day. One, because bearing children isn't easy. And anyone who's gone through that process, and I don't think we, we have any, you know, you know first-time expectant mothers in the room this year. You know, there's no one here. That, so we can kind of tell the truth a little bit more, right? <laughs> we don't have to hold back and try not to scare anybody. Everybody's kind of gone through that, right? It reminds me, every time I think about that, my, when my sister first got pregnant with her first child, you know, she tells a story about how she went to my mom and my aunt, and she was like, is it really that painful to go through childbirth? And they're like, no, the movies, they blow it out of proportion. It's, it's all acting. It's just drama. And then she went through it, and, and she's like, you lied to me. And they're like, yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they didn't want her to be scared, okay? And uh, here's the thing. Bearing children is not easy. You know, anyone who's gone through that process knows that. Of course, if you're there in Genesis chapter 3, look at, uh, look at verse 16. You know, and it's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be something that's, uh, you know, a cakewalk or a breeze. He said here, the Lord said unto the woman in verse 16, 
He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire to, shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You know, you'd think the childbearing was enough, right? That's enough of a punishment. And then she's also got, she's got to deal with the husband too, but that's kind of another sermon. Maybe we'll work on that on Father's Day. But, you know, what, one right here, we can look at one part of this verse and say, you know, being married alone is a lot of work, you know, for both people involved. You know, and the woman as well, you know, she's got to submit to her husband and, and, and all of that that comes along with that. But part of that relationship is the fact that, you know, they're going to be fruitful, they're going to multiply, and it's not going to be easy. I mean, why do you think the world puts it off? Why do you think the people out in the world today go to such great lengths to try to prevent having children? It's because it's not easy. You know, not just, you know, not just the, the actual burden of having a child, which they're worth every penny, you know, financially speaking, and all the other things that come with child rearing, but just the actual physical act of giving birth to a child is a very traumatic experience. It's something that's very difficult. I mean, we could think about, first of all, even before you get to the childbirth, just the pregnancy itself. I mean, just an incredibly uncomfortable and inconvenient uh, situation to be in. You know, especially if you're living in a climate like this, you know, where, you're, where you get pregnant and you're going to go through those most difficult months in the hottest part of the year. You know, the, you know, all the type of things that go along with that. You know, the, the back pains and everything else. The morning sickness is probably one of the first things we could think of. You know, I'm trying, I'm trying to remember all the things. That I go, I've never gone through the process. So I'm relying a lot on what I've seen my wife go through. There's probably going to be things that I miss, you know, just being a man. But, you know, the morning sickness is probably the first thing that comes to mind. That's usually one of the first onsets of, of pregnancy. Just the being nauseous all the time. And some ladies have this worse than others. But, uh, you know, I always think about this every time I get a little, you know, if I get sick, if I have, you know, stomach, get a stomach bug or something, I'm nauseous. You know, we're, you know, we men, at least for, I guess I can only speak for myself. I mean, I turn into a baby. You know, I'm, I'm laying on the bed. Oh, my tummy, you know. <laughs> and she's going, but when my wife gets pregnant, she's going through this for like weeks. You know, just, you know, it comes on then it, and it goes away. Then it comes on and it goes away. You know, you look over in the car and they're just like, you know. <laughs> And you feel bad for him, you know, and, and uh, but that's part of it, you know. So again, you know, this is, you know, we're going to talk about Mother's Day. Why do we celebrate it? Because of all the things that they go through to be mothers, okay? One of it would be the, the morning sickness, you know, what about all the hormonal changes that take place? You know, the mood swings and things like that, all the hormones in the body that are, that are changing. How about the fact that life doesn't stop just because you're pregnant? You know, the other kids still need to be fed. The other kids still need to be bathed and educated and everything else that comes along with that. The bills keep coming in. It's not like life goes, oh, you're pregnant? Well, let's we'll just put everything on pause for you. You know, no, life continues to go on. All the responsibilities, all the work that needs to be done, all the house cleaning and meal preparation and everything that takes place, all the things that come up in life, you know, they're, they're made you know, even more difficult by the fact that you're pregnant. And then, of course, there's the actual birth itself, you know, and again, uh, just being very blunt this morning, you know, it's a very painful and even dangerous process that a woman goes through. It's, you know, it's literally passing through the jaws of death. And you say you're being melodramatic. No, I'm not. Okay, and if you would turn over to Genesis chapter 35, and this is probably a more somber point in the sermon this morning, but it's one that we need to think about. You know, it's one that we as, 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 uh, uh, those of us, you know, I keep wanting to say, obviously we all have mothers, right? But this is something that we need to be reminded of when we think about our mother. The fact that they, you know, stared, in many cases, looked death right in the face and went through that process. Now, praise God, we live in a country and a society today with all the medical advancements that we have to where a lot of, you know, uh, other, you know uh, a lot of compromising situations when it comes to childbirth can, can be remedied. You know, life-threatening uh, circumstances can be taken care of, and the mortality rate is much lower than it has been in times past or in other, you know, un underdeveloped countries where it's much higher because birth is a dangerous process. It's very painful and dangerous. If you look at Genesis chapter 35, verse 16, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there came, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrata, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. And I don't know that there's any other kind. 
But you know, it's saying here that this was a especially difficult labor that she went through. And it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, which his father called Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried uh, in the way uh, to Ephrata, which is Bethlehem. So, you know, this is a, a start, you know, a very sobering reminder of the fact that, you know, there's, there's a mortality involved when it comes to childbirth. And in some instances, you know, wives or the mothers even die. And, uh, you know, this, you know, this is something that strikes a little bit closer to home. And my wife, you know, and I try not to be too personal here, and I do really ask her permission, but I don't, I'm sure she doesn't mind me sharing. You know, we've talked about it with other people in the church. We came close. I remember we, one of our children we gave birth to, and, you know, there was a lot of blood loss. The midwife didn't really know what she was doing, and I'm going to talk about that in a, mi in a minute here. And, uh, you know, I remember my wife talking about it. She just, you know, uh, it, it, all of a sudden, you know, this, this home birth, it turns into this home nightmare, and it's we got to get the ambulance over there. There's all this blood loss. The midwife is, you know, not a good midwife. And, and my wife, I remember later she recounted to me, she's just like, she's like, I was ready to go. <laughs> Everything was blacking out and she was just kind of feeling like, you know, that, and that's a scary feeling, you know. And uh, that would have been terrible. It would have been a tragedy. But here's the thing, you know, we kind of take it for granted today because of the country we live in. I mean, we were able to get in the ambulance, get over there, stop the bleeding and, you know, and, 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 and uh, take care of her and get her back, you know, in good health over time. But here's the thing what if we weren't living here what if there wasn't an ambulance to take us to rush us over there what if there wasn't you know blood uh, there to be to, to, to be received what if there wasn't somebody who knew how to treat the situation you know that would have been a tragedy and that's something that happened a lot more often in our past and because we kind of live in a society today where that's avoided you know the tendency might to think that oh childbirth isn't really that bad it's not that traumatic it's not that dangerous people live through it all the time and that's true but it's only in lieu of the fact that a lot of treatments are available. So, you know, and that kind of, I did kind of want to touch on the whole thing about giving birth, you know, home birthing. You know, and I, and I told this, I've said this to several people already. But, you know, home birth can be either the most wonderful, just a, just a great experience, or, it's, or it can be a terrible experience. And that's the, when people come to me and ask me about home birthing and my opinion about it, if they ask for advice, that's what I tell them. That's because that's been my experience with it. You know, that's where I'm speaking from. It's either one of the most just wonderful experiences when everything goes well. The best part is, you, you know, when everything's done, you're at home. You know, you don't have to pack up and get in a car. You don't have some nurse or doctor come in poking and prodding everybody and trying to push vaccines on you and everything else. You know, you get to make your decisions and you're at home. It's very comfortable. You know, the family's all together and you can move right into, you know, helping mom. Uh, you know, taking care of her and her taking easy. But when things go bad and now you have to transfer to hospital, I mean, that's one of the most just em emotionally draining, just exhausting experiences that you probably ever go through. I know it was for me. Because, you know, if you make, when you get back out of the hospital, you come home and it looks like somebody had just given birth there. Because <laughs> that's what happens. You know, there's a mess to clean up and, you know, life goes on and, and all that. So that's my advice about home birth, you know, and, and, and here's the thing, if you're considering that option, and I wouldn't discourage anybody from it, you know, and everyone's got to make their personal decisions. I'm not saying you're in sin if you don't do it, you know, you, you, people can make their decisions, uh, whatever they want to do. But if you do do it, here's my recommendation to everybody, is that don't, don't let the personality of the midwife be the determining factor, you know, because when you get into this midwifery, you get into kind of this more of this earthy, kind of all-natural, holistic, kind of hippy-dippy stuff, right? Yeah. Where they want to get into all this, you know, channeling the energies of the universe, you know. It's like, no, we're, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be crass or anything, but, you know, we're just, we're giving birth here, you know. <laughs> and here's the thing. You don't, you, don't go to, you don't go to your mechanic, and I don't like to, you know, these are the parallels I draw, you know. I'm often... You know, comparing women to cars and things like that. But I'm just, I'm trying to get us to understand a concept here, right? It's not that I'm disparaging of women, okay? I don't, we don't go to a mechanic and look at the mechanic and go, well, I don't like his piercing. Oh, he's got dreadlocks. You know, he smells like patchouli. I don't think he can work on my car. <laughs> you know what I mean? He wears sandals, for crying out loud. He, he can't work on my car. 
You know, if he does a good job, I don't care what he looks like. I don't care what he smells like. I don't care what he says. If he's good at his job, that's what I'm paying him to do. You got to take that same philosophy into when you're picking a midwife, you know, and ask very pointed questions. And if any, you know what, I'm not going to spend the time going through that. If people want to know about that, you come talk to me, talk to my wife. We can walk you through that process. But, you know, the whole point being is that, you know, birth is a very painful and very dangerous situation to be in. And that's why we need to celebrate Mother's Day today. It's because your mother went through the jaws of death for you. You know, even if the birth went great, there was no complications, amen. But there was, there was no guarantee of that when they went into it. I don't think there's anything Rachel did here to cause this to happen. Sometimes that's just the way things go. <coughs> and not only that, let's say, you know, you go through that process, even in the best birth, you know, there's still a, a time of recovery that has to take place. You know, and, and, and different ladies can recover at different rates, you know, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with the health that you have going into it and things like that. But recovering from birth, no matter for anybody, is difficult. Again, it's very traumatic. You know, there's more of the hormo hormonal changes, right? All of, all of a sudden, the hormones are changing again. There's, uh, you know, you have to start learning how to, you know, uh, uh, breastfeed the child if you're going to do that. That can be a whole other process. Maybe, the, you know, the child has lip ties and things like that. You know, this can be a very difficult time, a very trying time in a mother's life. And even some ladies, you know, they, they, and I believe they all probably go through this to some degree, but some ladies even su suffer from severe postpartum depression. We probably all heard of that. Postpartum depression, where there's just this huge change in hormones, and all of a sudden this mother you'd think would just be this joyful, beaming, radiant, you know, being of, of just gratitude and thankfulness can become very depressed and can become very saddened and even start to think very horrible thoughts. And here's the thing, if you ever know anybody that goes through this, do not despise that person. You know, because that's a big part of the why ladies don't ever get help is because they're so ashamed of the way the things that they're feeling, the things that they're thinking. They don't want to say that to anybody because they're, you know, they're afraid of the, 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 rep the repercussions or the backlash they might get. And here's what they have to understand is that you're not in your normal frame of mind when you go through that. And I, you know, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm going to say this, okay? There have been ladies that I know that have given birth that have thought, you know, with murderous intent towards their children, their newborn. And you say, wow, how, you know, what's wrong with them? There's nothing wrong with them. Nothing. It's, it's just their hormones. It's just this is traumatic thing. It's very, we can't understand it, you know, if we, if we haven't gone through it. And I bring that up not to put up somebody, if any, and I don't know if anybody in the room has gone through that. And I'm not trying to put anybody down that has. Okay, because that's just something that happens. But what I'm trying to get across here is that if we know somebody that's gone through that, we should not despise that person. We should not look down on that person. We should try to encourage them and help them and being a blessing to them and not go around telling everybody about it. You know, you hear what she was, you know, what, they're, what they, she was thinking, that kind of a thing. You know, that's a very uh, dangerous thing and it's a very concerning thing. And, you know, if you ever go through that, you need to seek professional help. You need, to, you need to get with somebody who can help you through that. You know, by all means, tell, tell somebody, a con somebody you're confident in, you know, express that to your spouse, but don't, don't just sit on that. Ladies need to address that, okay? Uh, and I didn't want to mention that because that needs to be mentioned because people go through that. We, we sometimes don't even realize that people go through that kind of a thing, but it does happen. And never despise a mother who goes through that. You know, we should care for her. So why are we celebrating Mother's Day today? Well, because of the fact that bearing children isn't easy, just the process of being pregnant, you know, what that leads up to, you know, the childbirth itself, that's not, there's nothing easy about that. And what about, you know, beyond that, is that, it, okay, so mom gives birth, you know, she goes through her, her mood swings, her hormones start to balance out, she learns how to feed the child and, and everything starts to kind of pan out and then it's just, it's just, you know, a cakewalk from there on out, motherhood's just a breeze from there on out, right? No, that now the real work has begun. Now some of the hardest work of being a mother is just getting started, okay? You know, caring for infants and toddlers is very demanding. You ever wonder why God made little kids so cute? <laughs> you know, the more I've had, I, I, and I got some cute kids, I'm not afraid to admit it, you know, it's because you, you go, I can't, I can't hurt this, this when they're frustrating, you can't like, well, I can't just, you know, get rid of them, look how cute they are, you know? It's to balance everything out, right? <laughs> you know, and I don't, and, and of course we love all the kids and stuff like that, but I mean, it's, it's a process. It's frustrating, you know, they, 
there's the, the, the fits they throw, the, you know, just all the things that kids do, the things that we did to our parents too. You know, they get back, get back at us. It's just a natural process of being a child. It's very demanding. You think about, you know, in the, through the infant stages, the midnight feedings the moms have to do. Just up at all hours. You know, you're on that baby's schedule. You know, whenever the baby wants to eat, that's when you're going to get up and feed it. You know, whenever the baby needs a diaper changed, you know, that's when you're going to change it. You know, and, and since it's Mother's Day, let me brag on my wife a little bit at this point, okay? That woman can change a diaper in the dark faster than anybody I know. <laughs> I, you know, I've changed maybe a handful of diapers, you know, in my life with my kids. I'll, and I'll do it, you know, I just, I'm not as good at it as she is. When you're, here's the thing. When you're, here's how you know you don't change very many diapers. When you, when you remove the diaper and it's like, it's like removing the scalp of your enemy. <laughs> you know, and you're like, whoo, whoo, whoo. And you're like, you know, doing like a dance through the, you know, like, she's like, great job, honey, yeah. You know, can you do it at 2.30 a.m. and, the, you know, coming out of a deep REM sleep, you know? I've seen her, I've like rolled over and I heard something and she's just like, <laughs> I'm like, man, like record time. I'm talking like, it's impressive, folks. It really is. But it's, you know what, it's challenging to have to keep up with it. He's like, well, what could possibly be so hard about this little tiny person? I mean, how much trouble could one little person really cause? Let me tell you, they can be a, a real inconvenience to the mother, a lot. And even dads too, you know, but we're not gonna talk about the suffering they go through because this is Mother's Day. <laughs> you know, the constant watching, you know, when the kids, starts to, the kids start to move around, they start to crawl and stand up and now they're walking. And it's like, oh, they took their first step and they're all excited and then very quickly they realize what they're in for, like, oh, <laughs> now they can move it on their own. All of a sudden, it's like, now they can get into every cupboard, and, you know, they have to watch the stairs, you have to watch whether or not they're gonna run towards the road or into traffic, you know, or the parking lot. You have to start to keep constant vigilance over these, these little people. You know, the process of, let's say, weaning, you know, if, if, you're, if you're breastfeeding the child, and now you have to go through that process of weaning, you know, that's not easy. You know, they have to put up with the fits and the, and everything that goes along with that. So it's not like, you know, mom gives birth and all of a sudden her work's done. You know, no, some of her hardest work has just begun. And this is one of the many reasons we need to celebrate Mother's Day today. You know, <coughs> and even beyond that, you say, okay, well, you know, she, she went through the difficulty of pregnancy. She, 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 she faced the dangers of childbirth and came out uh, on the other side. You know, and she's got the child through infancy and early childhood. You know, surely, surely now things are getting easier for her. Surely now this is, this is where life, you know, um, just becomes a breeze. No. Now the training of the children begins. The education of the children begins. And this can be a very daunting task to, to the ladies, you know, who homeschool, and which we are proponents of here. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing that, especially if you're, if you're jumping into that later in life, you know, let's say you decide that that's, a, that's something you want to do after having children that have been in the public education system, and you pull them out and you say, well, I'm going to start homeschooling them. That can be very daunting to people in that position. Even to a mother who's starting out with just one child, you know, from day one, she's going to instruct that child and teach that child. In either situation, homeschooling can be very intimidating, right? It's mu much easier to just ship them off and let the state do it. But here's the problem with that. They're going to be taught a lot of, you know, anti- Christ type of things. They're going to be taught a lot of, you know, fa science falsely so called. You're going to have they're going to have to come home and you have to do the work of trying to unravel that mess and 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 get the lies out of their head that they're being taught. That's another sermon. But you know you know the all the all the educating that takes place. And if you go to Pro go over to Proverbs chapter twenty nine, <coughs> you know, and that's just one small area of child ra of, of raising children. You know, the education. You know, you know, feeding the children the proper nutrition, making sure that they're getting the vitamins that they need. You know, if the child has a food allergy or, or their stomach is sensitive to certain foods, moms have got to figure that out. You know, they've got to, they've got to know their, chi their child's diet and feed them accordingly. They've got to educate them. You know, they've got to spiritually instruct them as well. You know, they have to, you know, read the Bible to them, teach them things out of the Bible. And you say, well, what about dad and all that? Yeah, dad has his part too, but the vast majority of this falls upon the mother. You know, and that's not a real popular notion today, but that's biblical. You know, dad is to, you know, dad is to be going out and working for a living and providing for the family. Therefore, mom is at home spending the vast majority of the time with the children, and she's the one that is to raise up children. 
You know, that you know the Bible teaches that. That they are to, to, to love and nurture their children and bring them up. <clears throat> you're, you're going to Proverbs 29. I'll read Proverbs 17. It says, He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his own sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. So we know that fathers certainly have a part to play, and maybe that'll be the Father's Day sermon. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. You know, one of the greatest joys you'll ever have in life is raising a godly child, raising a good kid. And it goes on and says, Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. So we know that mom and dad each have their, their part to play, and that you know, if they raise a fool, it's going to break, you know, their hearts. Both of them, likewise. But look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15. It says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. Now, what's that talking about? It's talking about a spanking, right? The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Notice it's exclusive to the mom. I'm not saying the dad... We already read, you know, the dad that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow. You know, if, he, if his child turns out to be a fool, he's not, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a sorrow to him. It's going to be a grief to him. But the Bible says that a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Why is that? It's because a child is not to be left to himself, meaning, you know, he's supposed to be left in the care of his mother. Children and mothers are supposed to be the ones that are bringing up the children, not leaving them to themselves. Now, what, is, what does that look like today when a child is left to themselves? You know, we could think about the mom who's just, you know, one, maybe just shipping the child off to daycare, shipping them off to, you know, the, the public education system, you know, and leaving them essentially to, them to fend for themselves in a world that, you know, does not have their best interests in mind. That's going to teach them things that are not biblical and anti-biblical, in fact. Well, what about, you want to say, well, I home you know, I keep the kids home, we take care of them. You know, you could still do that, you know, even though you, you keep them at home today, you could still leave your child to themselves through, uh, I don't know, social media. The mom who's just constantly, you know, you know, letting the children just run amok and rather than doing the housework and the raising and everything else that goes along with it, you know, she's just, you know, leaving, uh, you know, she's just on Facebook or YouTube or on the phone with their girlfriends or whatever, watching the soap operas, eating the bonbons and everything else. <coughs> you know, the mother has a big role to play and that's why it's work, right? And that's why so many, you know, ladies today, they, they want to avoid this. They want to they wanna go out and work a secular job as if that's, you know, any easier. But they don't want to do, go through the feeding, the education, the spiritual education. Why? And if you would, go over to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Because motherhood is sacrifice. Sum up motherhood in one word. Sacrifice. You know, what are other words that might come to mind? Selflessness. You know, it's, it, that's motherhood in a nutshell. It's just one long life of, of giving up your own uh, desires, your own comfort, your own, the, the things that you want for somebody else. Just over and over and over again. <clears throat> Look here in 1 Samuel chapter 1. I think this is a great picture of motherhood. Verse, verse 24, talking about Hannah, right? Hannah who had prayed for the, the Lord to give her a child. And the Lord granted that request. Because why? Because she had lent him onto the Lord. She said, Lord, if you give me a man child, he'll, he'll be yours all his days. You know, he'll serve you. And of course, that was the prophet Samuel. And it says in verse 24, And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bullocks and one ephah of flour. Now, I, I've preached in the past, ephah of flour is a lot of flour. Okay? And I can't remember all the calculations, but that's not, you know, enough, that's enough to make a lot of bread. So she's bringing a big sacrifice, right? Three bullocks? I mean, how many families could you feed on three bullocks? Probably a lot. I mean, basically today that would be like three beef cows, right? That's a lot of... I mean, today standard, I mean, I haven't looked at it in a while, but that's got to be like, who, who knows? How much, what would it cost? Just how many thousands of dollars would three heads of steer be? It's got to be over 10, 000, 10 grand, right? Yeah, about $12,000. $12, that's what I'd figure. So that's what she, now, of course, this is their currency back then. But I mean, think about what she's bringing here as a sacrifice for this child. 
And one ephah of flour and one bottle of wine shows you one thing that, you know, wine in the Bible was a very precious commodity back then, right? <coughs> and brought, you know, that's why it was so special to drink a glass of grape juice back then. People go, oh, wine in the Bible. And I'm kind of going off here, you know. And why do you, what do you mean it's non-alcoholic? You're telling me that's just Welch's grape juice? Yeah. Well, what's so big deal about that? Well, I don't know. It was really hard to come by. Yep. <coughs> You know, because it wasn't hand-pressed or, or it was hand-pressed. It wasn't just being made in some factory while you sleep. <coughs> and it says here, she brought a bottle of wine and she brought him under the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young and they slew a bullock and, the child, uh, and brought the child to Eli. So she's making this great sacrifice of her substance, right? And it goes on in verse 26 and says, And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the one that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord for this child I prayed and the Lord hath given me my petition and uh, which I asked of him therefore I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth he shall be lent to the Lord and she and he worshiped there uh, excuse me and he worshiped uh, she worshiped there the Lord the Lord there excuse me jump down to uh, chapter 2 verse 18 of course we know the story of Samuel so she's she's making the sacrifice of her substance you know, she's giving her child to the Lord, the, this one that she'd prayed for. You know, she's, this is, a, this is a, a, you know, a very precious thing that she's doing. And she says in verse 18 of chapter 2, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child. So she takes them up there and she just leaves them to be raised by Eli, you know, and to serve God all of his days. And being a child girded with the linen ephod, moreover, his mother made him a little coat. And I love that. And I've preached other Mother's Day sermon on this passage. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year, and she came up with her husband uh, when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. So as they came up there to Shiloh to uh, sacrifice every year, she knew, you know, Eli was going to be there, and he's going to be a little or not Eli, excuse me, Samuel's going to be there, and you know what? He's going to be a little bit bigger this year, and some years he's going to be even a little bit more bigger. <laughs> they get after they reach a point where they really start to shoot up. So what would she do every year? She'd bring him a nice new coat that would fit him. Now think about what that would entail. First of all, she has to you know, go out, because it wasn't like she just went down to the Goodwill and picked up a secondhand little coat and brought it up there. You know, and she, she might not have even been able to go get the fabric herself. She didn't just go to, she might not have been able to go down to a place like Joanne Fabrics and pick out a nice pattern. She might have even gone so far as to actually make the fabric herself. Right. And I don't know a lot about it, and quite frankly, a lot of people don't know a lot about it because we don't really have to deal with that today. But that's a very laborious process of having to gather wool or linen and you know, weave those things together and you know, just to make, get the fabric just to make the garment. Now you got the fabric, now you have to cut out the pattern, sew it, put it all together. It's a lot of work. That's why today you know, it's so much cheaper just to go buy clothes than to try to make them yourself. <coughs> but she said, so there's the, the aspect of her just having to gather these materials, the effort that went into that. But think about the fact that she only saw this boy, as far as we know from, the, from Scripture, once a year. So she had, while she's making this coat, she has to think in her mind about what size he might be. You know, she has to look, maybe look around the boys around her that are his age you know, and start to think about how, you know, I've got to make a coat. This coat's got to be a little bit bigger than maybe he is fit for him now. It's got to last him here. He's got to grow into it. What's going on here? There's a lot of planning and intention going on in Hannah's mind. I think it's a great picture of motherhood. You know, this is a mother weaving something together for her child, something that's going to fit him just right and, and be durable and last. You know, we could apply that to our own, you know, uh, to, to ourselves as mothers today. You know, are you, what are you weaving into the fabric of your child's life? Are you planning? Are you doing the work? Are you, are you cut, you know, do you have a pattern for your child's life? Are you putting it together? Is it going to fit them? Are they going to be able to grow into that? I think this is a beautiful picture of motherhood, of her taking the forethought and the and the and the the you know having the insight and the ability and, and just really p planning to what for her child to to suit him appropriately. I mean, a, a little coat every year, all the forethought, all the intention, and the effort that it took for her to 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 get uh, Samuel that coat every year. If you look at verse 20, it says, And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give the uh, seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. 
and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. So it's not like motherhood is just this, you know, thankless task. You know, there is a reward for motherhood. And it's more than just you get a special day once a year where the, you know, the, the preacher's going to stand up and, and, and laud your, your praises. And there's a lot, there's a, there's a greater reward for mothers. I mean, for Hannah here, we know that, you know, she was barren prior to this. And because what she was willing to do, the Lord blessed her and opened her womb. And she conceived and she had even more children. You know, and the Bible's showing us that that's a blessing. The fact that she had more kids was a blessing, not a curse, yeah. not an inconvenience, not a burden. That's what she wanted. And wouldn't to God that that's the way all women were today, that they would desire to have children, because that's what God wants. You know, to, to have children is a, is a blessing. Amen. And God blesses her. That was the reward. More children for doing such a good job. So the Lord, the, you know, of course, the reward uh, for the, the sacrifice that she made was, you know, we could look at it numerically. You know, she multiplied. She had more kids. There's that part of it. But also spiritually. If you look at the end there, it says, And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. And of course, we know Samuel goes on to become a great man of God. I mean, he's used mightily by the Lord. He anoints, you know, uh, the first two kings of Israel. And he does great exploits for the Lord. Now, none of that would have happened if, you know, a, a little, just meager mother, you know, to be, no, nobody knew, nobody paid any mind to, hadn't gone to that temple and prayed for that child and lent in the Lord. And then took the time to, to care for that child and wean that child and bring him back and follow through and make the sacrifices and do all the planning. You know, Samuel just didn't, just, you know, the stork didn't drop Samuel off at Eli's footstep one day. You know, it took somebody to make a sacrifice. And that's the way it is for moms. You know, if moms are going to have children that grow up before the Lord and do something for God, they're going to have to make sacrifices. You know, they're going to be the ones that are going to have to sit down with intent and plan out what it is they're going to put and weave into their child's life spiritually and all these other areas as well. And here's the thing. It's worth it. See, it sounds like a lot of work to be a mother this morning. It is. It's probably, you know, and I, and I don't say this just to, again, earn brownie points or, 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 you know, whatever. It's a very hard job. I don't want, <laughs> I don't think I could do it. <laughs> I mean, if I had to, I, I'm sure I could, but, you know, we as men, we think we work very hard and we do. You know, we go out and we work very hard jobs. But here's the thing. At some point, most of us get to punch out. Right. Yeah. We get to come home and put our feet up and enjoy a meal. That's not always the case with mom. I mean, they get their breaks here and there. But they're on call 24-7. You know, I remember there was that, that, that uh, video people put out years ago, this, this fake job interview, where they had candidates come in. They didn't tell them what the position was. And they started to tell them about the position. They're just like, well, here's the thing. You know, you're, our client you know, needs constant care and attention. You're gonna, you know, no vacations, no sick days, no holidays, no personal days. You know, you're going to have to be there available 24-7. Uh, they're going to need you in the middle of the night. Um, if you're sick, you still got to come in. You know, they're going to be sick. You're going to have to take care of that. And there are people who are like, who would do this job? And they're like, oh, by the way, th there's no pay. <laughs> <laughs> Just none. There's no retirement plan. There's no 401k. None of that. And people are like, uh, thanks, but no thanks. And they're like, but what is the job? And they're like, oh, it's called being a mother. And they're like, oh, you know. And it was this thing to try to guilt you into calling your mom. Right? Which you should, right? <laughs> but here's the thing, you know, uh, motherhood is a lot of work, but it's worth it. It's worth all the sacrifice. It's worth all the toil. You know, and I, and I kind of, I was trying to direct it more uh, at those of us, you know, at, at, at the mothered more than the mothers, but it kind of turned into a, a sermon for both. But, you know, go back to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. Motherhood's a very special thing. One, you know, only half the population gets to do it. You know, and the rewards are exclusive to that portion of the population. But they can make a profound impact on the world through the children that they raise. You know, a lot of mothers aren't ever, they're never going to be lauded in today's society. They're not going to be in the spotlight. You know, they're not going to get invited to the White House. And, and, you know, not that a lot of them probably won't even want to go anyway. But, <laughs> you know, the world's not going to sing their praises. In fact, today, a lot of them, they, the world, in many cases, downplays the role of a mother. Unless you're a single mother, right? 
But here's the thing. It's a very special thing to do, to be, to be a mother. And here's, an, here's another aspect that I want us to think about that makes it special. The fact that you only have this life to do it. Sorry, Mormons. <laughs> yeah. Right? It ends at this life. You have this one time in your life to be this type, to be this person, to be a mother. Don't let that pass you by. You know, embrace that. You know, some people, you know, they, they, maybe they don't get to, to, to experience that till later in their life. And maybe to not the degree that other ladies do. Maybe they only have a few kids. Maybe they only have one child. You know, still, all the same, em embrace that. Be thankful for that. It should make you even more grateful. But here's, here's the thing I want, us to, I want to close on. Look at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 22. It says, Hearken to the father that beget thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Despise not thy mother when she is old. Why would the Bible have to tell you to not despise your mother when she's old? Well, maybe people have a tendency to do that. And maybe, maybe not so much despise as take her for granted. You know, we grow up, we become adults, and we think, well, I made it through. You know, she's done mothering me. You know, was it really that tough? Was it really that big of a deal? Yeah, it was. We don't appreciate it as much as children. You know, we just, as kids, we just kind of expect it. Well, of course she's going to cut the crust off and cut it diagonally, you know, when she feeds me the PB&J. <laughs> That's what mom does, you know. Yeah, it's time to brush my teeth, mom. Come on. You know, it's just they expect it. And then we kind of, but when we get older, you know, we should look back on that and be grateful. Not take our mother for granted. Everything that they went through. Why should you celebrate Mother's Day today? Because of all the hard work she went through to bring you into this world and then to raise you to become the person that you are today or are going to become one day. So here's a question. Have you called your mother? Have you? Or is this just another routine holiday? Is this another just, you know, you're going to go home and cross it off the calendar? Well, we got through that one. And this is a, the, you know, there's a reason why Mother's Day is on the calendar. To make you stop and make you think about the fact that your know, mother went through a lot for you. And that's why we're preaching this sermon this morning. To remind us of the hard work that our mothers go through. <coughs> so, <coughs> let's not take our moms for granted. Let's remember everything they did for us. And, you know, let's, let's, let's love them. Let's pray for them. And let's, let's uh, you know, and praise them for what they've done. Because it's a lot of hard work. And, and none of us would be here if they had gone through it. Right, let's go ahead and pray.